Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see everyone. Thank you for braving weather and, and mud to come. Um, so we're excited to have Secretary Anson Tebbets with us today. Um, he was appointed by Governor Phil Scott to be the Secretary of Agriculture, Food and Markets in 2016. Um, he grew up on his dairy farm in Cabot, where his family raised Jersey cows and sheep and ran a Vermont maple syrup sugaring operation. And while farming, Anson also had a long career in broadcasting in both radio and television. And a, uh, an award-winning reporter and storyteller, Anson's last position was managing reporters, editors, and photographers for television. Anson still lives in Cabin on his farm, where his son Alden, a student at Middlebury College, hunts uh, wild turkey and deer. Uh, his wife, Vicki, enjoys foraging the land, and his daughter, Adele, loves the forest and baking. A, a nature lover and birder, Anson's radio show for the birds can be heard weekly on Radio Vermont. And he's going to talk to us today about developments in Vermont agriculture, including new products and technology, um, adaptations for climate change and improving farm resiliency, uh, and implications for the Vermont's landscape. And he'll be he'll be um, happy to entertain questions as well. So thank you very much for Secretary Tebbins. Well, thank you very much. Um, here we go. Got to remember how to use a microphone again. So, so I, I recognize a lot of you folks in, in a past life or current life, many people I may have run into in my uh, media world, maybe my ag world at the agency when I was deputy secretary or at the state house. Uh, so it's good to see all of you here. Um, and what a great opportunity uh, to have a, a chance to talk about agriculture with you. Um, so first, um, just a little bit of, you know, we do, uh, from time to time, we do research at the Agency of Agriculture. And we have a, you know, we have a hotline where people call in with, with questions and concerns, and maybe we can provide some technical assistance. So it's about that time of year where it's um, uh, people getting their checks, you know, maybe across the way that people order them and they're about ready to get their checks. And, and I always want to do the story of the, the mail carrier who has to take the chicks and the chicks, the last person on the route is the delivery and they had to listen to the peeping all the way through the muddy back roads. So that occurs. But this person was new to Vermont. You know, since the pandemic, we've had a lot of new people move to Vermont. Um, a lot of it, they want to learn about, you know, backyard raising chickens and so forth. So they called us and lo and behold, um, they got the day old chicks. Um, uh, they went home. They prepared the soil uh, perfectly, and they, you know, they got the rows. Um, and um, so the the new farmer um, planted them with feet down. And of course, the next day, the next morning, they went out, and of course, all they're all dead. Well, as you know, you can order another round of chicks pretty easily. So the new farmer orders another round of chicks. But this time, he says, well, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to put them head first. <laughs> so he puts them head first. And that's where we come in. So they call us, and we've got the Agency of Agriculture. We know all. This so, really happened? <laughs> well, and then, and then um, so what we do is, you know, we send a field agent out. So we went out, and we saw the, you know, the chick, dead, dead chickens, and we said, well, the first thing we got to do is get a soil test. <laughs> so there you go. Anyway, that's my one ag joke. <laughs> so there you have it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> we'll plant the eggs. <laughs> we'll eggs. But yeah, there are a lot of people. They love the chicks until the, the rooster shows up, and then the rooster starts crowing early in the morning, or a weasel gets them all. But all good. So I thought maybe we'd do a little overview of um, what we actually do um, at the agency. 
Um, and then I'm going to talk about there's something new app which is called the Ag Census. It's done across the country. It's done every five years, and it just came out on Valentine's Day. So there's some new data about, you know, it's a, it's a, a snapshot of, of what, what's happening now in, in Vermont. And then anyway, we talk about the flood and the, the flood recovery. And I'm happy to take, if anyone here wants to jump up and ask a question in midstream, please do that. I want it to be um, back and forth. Um, first of all, the mission of the Agency of Agriculture. Um, here it is. Facilitate, support, and encourage the growth and viability of agriculture while protecting the working landscape, human health, animal health, plant health, consumers, and the environment. So if you, as you drove or walk, walked here today, uh, there might have been a point where we were involved. So maybe you had to gas up. So if you look, uh, we have a division called Weights and Measures. So if you look, you'll see a sticker uh, right there, and we inspect to make sure you're getting the, the proper amount of gasoline that's calibrated correctly. So we inspect um, that particular area. The evolution of that is some of you may have an electric car and you may be charging. Um, so we will, we will soon be having a program to make sure you're getting what you're paying for as you pay for electricity at your charging station. So that's the evolution of, of weights and measures. Um, you may have stopped and got some, um, some sliced deli meat or something. We inspect scales, so that's something that we do as well. Maybe at the farmer's market, you, you buy something and those scales are inspected to make sure because you're paying by the pound. Um, we do all of that. So there's a lot of things um, that we do. Um, we have 143 employees, and in state government, that's relatively a small um, agency. Um, but it's an agency with 143 um, positions. And then we have various divisions that do various projects. So we have the administration, which, which is I'm a part of. Uh, we have food safety and consumer protection. Uh, we have agriculture development, public health and agriculture resource management. We have a lab in Randolph, which is relatively new. Uh, remember the flood in Irene went, went through Waterbury, destroyed the lab there. New lab was created, and it's just off the campus uh, of Vermont State University, former VTC. Uh, relatively new, it's only a couple years old. So there is what we have. And then we have uh, the Agriculture Water Quality uh, Division. So we work to create jobs uh, through the Agriculture Development Division, um, new business and markets, um, water quality. We regulate feed, seed, fertilizer and pesticides. And then, then food safety consumer protection, which is our biggest uh, arm of the, of the agency. It's all related to you know, animal health, um, dairy, meat, weights and measures, et cetera. So we inspect on the farm. So if someone's milking cows, goats, or sheep, we check for sanitation to make sure the milk is safe and uh, as it heads to maybe a, a processing facility. We're also in the, the cabots of the world. So Cabot cheese, we have inspectors making sure that they, they're following the, you know, the protocol and everything is safe there. We're also in our, our meat plants, uh, inspecting both federal um, and state. Um, the meat regulations are probably the most complicated of any um, regulations that we do. They're very strict um, because of just uh, the nature of uh, safety with meat. Um, there's USDA regulations. USDA, for inspecting USDA, it can go across state lines. But if you're only inspected with us, the state, you cannot sell outside the borders of Vermont. So some people who want to have bigger markets um, go into the USDA, um, go into the USDA market. So that's a little bit of what we do. Total budget for the agency is about 55 million. Um, that includes you know, state dollars, um, fees, special funds. And we get a lot of federal funds uh, through USDA. About 38% of our dollars uh, come from the US Department of Agriculture uh, with various um, grants. Now I want to talk about the census. So the census is kind of interesting. Those that really like data, um, we get a snapshot of um, you know, what's happening in Vermont, but also what's happening um, across the country. So every state um, does this. It's done every five years. Um, so the last one was done in 2017, and this 
it takes them a year to uh, I, um, figure out all the data. So this does not include um, last year's flood. So it's, it ended on 2023. Um, so this has been around 180 years. Uh, we've been collecting this. Um, it, and they can break it down into national, state, right into the county level across the country um, as well. So th what is the threshold for something for agriculture? Um, since 1974, uh, the Census of Agriculture has defined a farm as any place from which $1,000 or more of ag products were produced and sold or normally would have been sold during the census year. So not a huge threshold, $1,000, so, but important. Uh, looking at some of the data, in 2017, uh, we had 6,808 farms and we dropped to 6,537 at the latest, so it's a drop of 4%. It's about 300 farms uh, that we lost in, in the five years. And granted, this is just the census. Um, the average farm size, um, 2017, it was 175 acres, and now we're up to 180 acres, so about a 3% increase. So you're going to see a trend of fewer farms, larger farms, consolidation. You'll see it everywhere. You see it, you see it in banking, you see it in media, you see it in retail, you see it in agriculture as well. Um, don't know what the answer is, but it's, it's a fact. Uh, looking at some of our neighbors, so uh, pick a state. Who wants to pick a state? Give me a state and I'll give you a... New Hampshire. New Hampshire? Okay, New Hampshire, uh, according to the latest census, lost 4.2%. 4.2%. I heard Maine. Maine. Maine was 7.4. They lost 7.4. Looking at the data, it looks like every state uh, lost farmers. California? California, 10.5%. 10.5%. Wow. So they have tremendous amount of farms. They're, I mean, and that, some of that food's coming our way. So, so some of that they're merging? Yeah, this, this is probably merging. You'll see that, um, you've, we see that in Vermont, maybe uh, a dairy farm will go out, uh, another farm will um, either buy or lease their land, maybe take on their cows or their cows will be, become part of that um, operation. Another state? I don't think they did, uh, I don't think they break it down that much. The question was natural disasters. Do we know of the, um, why we lose farms? There's various, um, various reasons we lose farms, and some of the data will show economics for sure. Uh, family structures are complicated at times, so the next generation, and we'll get into some of the data on um, the aging population and how that's impacting agriculture. Um, and we, I just attended a, um, a workshop at a dairy conference, and she was from Canada, and her job was to essentially try to mediate some of the disputes between families passing the farm down to the next generation. Really complicated stuff, really difficult conversations with folks. Um, multiple siblings, maybe one child stayed on the farm, two others didn't. How does the farmer decide how to you know, transfer that land? So it gets really complicated, but she has a, her entire business is trying to mediate disputes of transferring um, farm operations to, to the next generation. So, so does the census include Amish um, That is a good question because they would, if they did it, they'd have to go to the, right? They would have to go to the and do it. That's good. I, that's, I'll have to follow up on that, whether they do or not. And we do have some in Vermont. We have some Amish farmers now in Vermont. They are in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, I believe it's um, Coventry. It's the old Walker Farm. I think they settled. There's a, there's a couple. Um, and I've got to visit them. Uh, I think they have some open Saturday uh, events where they sell some of their products. But it's in the Northeast Kingdom in, um, in, in, in Coventry 
in that area. Any other state you want to know about? Iowa. Iowa. Um, 1%. A lot of stuff going on in, in some of these significant row crop states. A lot of issues with, uh, in those states with ownership of land. Uh, some states are worried about China buying too much of the land, so they're putting in statutes. So places like, you know, Iowa, um, the Dakotas, I think we've got some legislation with that. Yes? Yeah, we can get down into some of the, uh, any other states and I'll move on to some more, that, yes. Nebraska, I'm learning my map here, um, uh, 4%. Minnesota, 4.8%. New York, 8.3%. New York is a significant dairy state, major, major dairy state. They, they are the fifth largest uh, um, production in dairy. What are the numbers? California, Wisconsin? California, um, Wisconsin? Wisconsin, Idaho, a lot, tremendous growth in the Dakotas now. But these are, I mean, they're putting in, you know, these are um, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 uh, dollar uh, herds, numbers of cows. Significant, significant. So you can well imagine. Um, and we're, you know, we do have large farms, but nothing um, to that scale. We have 36 farms that are 700 cows or more. We, call, we regulate farms in three categories. Large farm, LFOs, medium farm, which is 200 to 700. 700 plus is LFOs, and then the rest. So we have about 36 farms in Vermont that are over 700 cows. And we know that through the there are regulations and, and how we inspect them, et cetera. In the what category? In the middle category. The middle category is, is um, it's about 200 and 230 or something like that. When you're counting, you're counting the heifers, you're counting yep. everybody. Yep, yep, yep. One more state we had. I actually wasn't a state oh. question. Um, yeah, a lot of, um, uh, this relates to cow comfort. So, um, you know, the traditional, you know, if we, we talk about the old red barn, they were, you know, tied in, you know, wintertime. For, for example, when I was growing up, our cows went in the barn, probably the weather was, you know, in October, and they didn't go out till May 15th. So they in barn, and I got to stay home to let the cows out on, and you see some of these, you see some of these posted on social media now, they have big events now. I, I think I just saw one on Sweden where they let the cows out, they've been inside uh, in Thai barns um, uh, for a long time. And the organic standards are moving away from that, so organic standards are saying they've got to have so many days outside year round. So that, that there's a lot of nostalgia with that, but so there's a lot of, you know, folks, I mean our cows were, you know, they were taken care of and beautiful, but they were inside and tied for a long time. That's why they jump and go wild when they let them out on the green grass. Organic standards, I thought they had to be outside every day. There had to I'm, be options to do I'm not, they just changed them, so I'm, you may be right on that, but they, they certainly, it's a requirement that X number of days they certainly have to be out um, and change that. Uh, Bag Bomb is uh, 125 years old. This year, I mentioned bag bomb because when the cows went out for the first time, sunny day in May, they all came back with sunburns. And can you imagine milking a cow with a sunburn and how so tubs and tubs of bag bomb were used. And there's a story that um, bag bomb tells where the men had absolutely the softest hands <laughs> in the world because of the use of the, the bag bomb. But bag bomb has become a, uh, they've evolved into how you know, the world is involved, so it's, it, they're doing it for consumers now, as opposed to you know, buying tubs. You know, the, but they're 100, significant, 125 years old, out of Linenville. Uh, they're still at it. I was started by a guy named John Norris, who never went through the FDA 
approval process. He did it by, he always marketed it as for cows, but we all know it can <laughs> cure lots of things. So he never went through FDA approval, but word of mouth. Yeah, no people. I mean, people swear by it now. They can, they you know, they've got little, little, little parts, but letting the cows out for the first time was always the one I used. I remember bag bomb. All right, moving on. So, um, some of the data so we can get out to some of the counties. Uh, anyone from Addison County? Addison County has um, 751 farms, so they're our leading ag county, followed by Franklin. 707, Windsor, Rutland, Chittenden, Orleans, Orange, Caledonia, Washington, and then Wyndham. Can you divide that up between organic versus not? Do I don't think they. I don't think they. They, they don't do it by the. Um, but there are. There is some data out there on Vermont nationally has some of the highest levels of organic production uh, in the United States. In dairy or Dairy, vegetables yeah. as a whole has some of the highest, about 25% of our dairies are organic in Vermont. That's just the dairy side. Um, uh, the organic, um, uh, there are two, I would say, three main buyers. There's Stonyfield which is started, was started in New Hampshire. They're a buyer. Um, organic Valley. Organic Valley would be the other significant yeah. um, buyer. Um, our farm in 1994 was organic. Um, and it was started, it shows you how fast the organic world has grown. In 1994, there were, I think, seven farmers that went to something called the Organic Cow, which was out of Tunbridge. And that um, grew. And my parents, what they did it for was because the system for paying farmers for milk is so complicated. It's, it's, you don't know what you're going to get paid for until 30 days after you deliver your product. So think about that. So you have, it's month to month. So it's really, really hard from a planning aspect to know what you're going to be up against. So it could be, you know, Ten dollars, a hundred weight, one month, and it could go up, down. So this roller coaster, and I think my parents finally made the decision because they got a contract with Organic. So they got a contract with Organic Valley. I mean, Organic Cow, but that's been spun off. It was, I think, it became Hood at one point, um, and at one point, it, I think it ended up being Horizon, which was just exited the region at some point. But just only since 1994, so it it went. Uh, incredibly, incredibly fast. Uh, land and farms by use, acres. Uh, cropland, 436,000 acres are in cropland. Uh, pasture land is about 89,000 acres across Vermont. And we are seeing Vermont uh, grow up to woods. So woodland is at 569,000 uh, acres. Uh, top counties, land and farms, again, Franklin County, 182,000 acres is in uh, farmland. Addison, second, 177. Orleans, 121. Rutland, 116. And Orange at uh, 87,000 acres. All right. You loving all this data? Um, Uh, well, current use, you would know about current use, is uh, it, 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 does, it doesn't necessarily, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think we can say definitively, as long as it's not in development. I mean, it's being used, and there's so many rules and regulations around current use. You know, how many acres are eligible? You've got to have a certain threshold of number of acres produced. Um, we haven't seen any changes in current use in a while. You know, and, uh, but without current use, I can guarantee you there would not be as many farms as there are now because uh, it's being taxed on its use value for agriculture. And if that was to go away, uh, you would have a lot of folks exiting because there, there's no way they, that m amount of acres you could pay on development prices. Incredible program. 
So we talked about age. Um, uh, so 2012, the average farmer age was 55. 2017, 55.9. And then 2022, it's 57.7. So that's the average age. So we got an issue, without a doubt. It's probably the number one issue I talk with a lot is figuring out uh, an aging population that's maybe trying to retire and transfer the property uh, to the next generation or someone else that maybe has not been in farming that wants to get into farming. Two major issues. One is cost the cost of land is tremendous, yeah. very expensive. So someone um, getting into the farming for the first time, taking on a lot of debt, if they can afford it. And then usually the situation is you may have a farmer, um, a couple that still needs some sort of income, uh, even though they're retired. And then there's gotta be an income for the, the new generation that's come on. Um, and I mean, agriculture is not, al is not alone. The margins are tight. I mean, they're, they're extremely tight. Um, and it's, um, so that's, that's an issue there. I think that a question. What about, um, how many of the farms would you say the land is conserved? Does that conserve oh, yeah. The we have a tremendous amount of land um, that is conserved in Vermont. I think the latest from the land trust is that we had 1,000 uh, farms that were conserved. So, and that, and that's forever. So, that's there's you know sometimes when a, an easement is drafted, they do carve out a little bit of land, maybe for uh, a son or a daughter that maybe wants to build a house. Um, so we have a so it has to be used for agriculture. So we are seeing um, we are seeing places that may be growing up, you know, in, in brushes it's, if it's not actively used. Uh, the working landscape is really important. Um, so, yeah, and then we've got, uh, we're having cases now where um, the housing is really impacting agriculture as well. Um, you may have seen where um, some of our processing facilities cannot find enough help um, because they cannot find enough housing um, for folks. Cabot is an example. Cabot, right up the road. Um, the plan in Cabot, um, I think they've, they talked about they couldn't get some product out because they didn't have enough employees. They're running two dorms from Goddard. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, they are running um, dorms from Goddard and, um, and that's helping. Um, but it also goes to the Jasper Hills up in Greensboro. Yeah. Um, they, there's an audience out there that wants to move to Vermont, enjoy Vermont, loves the outdoors, loves the recreation loves the mission of you know making cheese but they're having issues with um, finding uh, housing that's affordable for for young people so it all is tying in here um, with a you know with with housing impacting um, you know products yes sir Um, Vermont has tried to do that. We have tried to maybe go to a supply management system, um, but um, Congress uh, probably would not allow it. It got very close at one point. There was, I want to say, it was prior to me coming, but when I've been, I want to say during the uh, time of Speaker Boehner, it was during his, there was a very close uh, a lot of energy, very close to getting it. Uh, we had the Northeast Dairy Compact with, for a while. That was very successful. Uh, but the issue with dairy, it's very regional. And um, so the North is, you know, the Northeast is different. Um, the Midwest is different. Now we've got new players that are significant, like Texas is growing tremendously with dairy. New Mexico is growing. Some of the folks from California have gone to Idaho. And now I'm seeing lots of reports of like South Dakota having um, significant uh, increases in dairy production. 
Um, but some of the co-ops post-COVID, soon after COVID, put their own systems in where they were not allowing some farmers to grow uh, and put on, uh, and that's the dilemma here because if it, it's like this, it's, a, it's an endless battle. So if a price is low to the farmer, then they think, some farmers think they need to put on more cows <laughs> to you know, get more milk so they can get paid more. And then when it gets really good, the same effect can happen as well. Like the price is really good, I gotta make my money really fast because I know a down thing is gonna happen again. They are working on some tweak with the federal system. And the federal system is, was created you know, in the 20s, 30s, and no one has been able to really uh, figure out a system that um, you know, works for everybody. And it can get very territorial. You know, um, you know, um, but we we're blessed with big markets around us. So, you know, the Wisconsins they're dying to get into the New Yorks and the Washingtons and the Bostons, and that's where our markets are, and they'll move it across if they can. So it become it becomes at times very territorial. But everyone is kind of in the same boat too. Everywhere I go, you know, the nutrition rate is about the same for every state. So that would tell you whatever system is in place now. Well, the, the market share. So you'll see, um, you know, explore the dairy case sometimes and look at some of the products that you're seeing. You're going to, you're having, but you're going to having, you're seeing, you're seeing uh, Telemuc. Yes, that's coming from like Oregon. That's Oregon. So that's, so they're, they're on the doorstep and they're trying to eat into the market share um, in Vermont. So. Yeah, I mean the two, the two main processors, Ben and Jerry's of course, um, Cabot, Agamark, and then uh, Vermont Creamery, uh, which is, has a butter line, a cow's butter, um, but it also has a goat cheese. Um, Vermont Creamery is uh, a company that could use more goat's milk from the region, and that's one of the things we're trying to do. Um, we're trying to, we need sheep's milk as well. We talked about the Amish. Uh, the Amish are providing some milk for uh, Grafton. Grafton has a combination um, cow and sheep's cheese. I think it's called Chep's Hog. Award winning, amazing. But they're sourcing some of that um, sheep's milk from the Amish in New York. So anyone want to start milking sheep here? Come on. <laughs> we could use, we, we, need about a, we need about a thousand more goats too. So, and we've got one significant um, large goat farm that started up in Hyde Park, um, Jonesland Farm, and they made the transition. They decided to get out of the cow business because it was, they couldn't really grow and it was, it was kind of, it was their time to try something different. So they've got uh, about a thousand goats that they're milking and they're supplying it to Vermont Creamery, which is up in um, Websterville, very town. And they're owned by Land Lakes, which is a you know, Fortune 500 significant company. Um, so just some key summary points on the um, census. So our farms are down by about 300. Uh, smaller farm numbers are diminishing. It's probably not a headline there. Um, so expenses are up. Farming income is, is up as well, a little bit. Um, and the people that are making the decisions on the farms are 35 years and older. So, right. Yeah, well, what, what, how do they, uh, how do the farm owners figure in if farmer A buys farmer B out and farmer C out? Do those two farms remain under what, however they're incorporated, or do they come under the are they counted as three farms now? Uh, I think they, it, it would, under this, I'm not sure, but under the, sort of the regulatory thing, so if, you know, farmer A buys farmer B and they're already under regulation, they have to notify us so we know that, you know, they've increased by 300, 400 cows and they may have an amendment to their, to the, to their permit. So we, we can track it, um, we can track it that way. But you are seeing, um, you know, it, it's not a huge um, 
consolidation across Vermont, but there's a few here and there that have either uh, you retired and someone else has um, bought their herd. There is a need right now this nationally, some of the dairy is going into beef now, which is, I don't know if you've seen some of the stories where the beef prices are really good now for the beef ranchers. Um, and a lot has to do with the supply is down. So a lot of, and you know, how long it takes, it takes a couple years to produce a, a cow for slaughter. But a lot of some of the dairy heifers are now going into the, to the meat supply, which is impacting it. But the ranchers are having some good times now, but they're, they're gonna be behind. So that's probably impacting what you're paying at the, at the supermarket for your, for your beef. Yeah, they're include they're included in there. So it's a, it's it's dairy, it's vegetable, it's maybe apples, um, berries, fruits, um, etc. Talk about grass fed versus not in the not in the census. Um, we just um, and that's it, there is there's organic and then there's grass fed and there's some some of the companies buyers are looking strictly for grass fed. Um, uh, products. Cruelty free, right? Yeah, there's many, 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 many things. Um, the certification for organic is done by NOFA, which is the Northeast. So they do the certification of you know the standards, and we made some progress nationally on that. When Horizon exited, we worked with the uh, USDA to make sure because there were standards, but they really weren't being enforced. So you had mega herds maybe out in the Midwest that they were moving animals back and forth with limited time in between. You know, they could be conventional cows and they were moving them in quickly. Um, so that some of that inspection is now, um, they're committed to doing some of those inspections to make it more authentic. Um, so that was uh, one of the blessings with Horizon leaving the region. Is the slaughterhouse issue, the lack of them causing some of these farmers to yeah, the slaughter, the slaughter um, that is uh, an issue that we made a little bit of progress on. It's, um, we have about mm, 14, 15 facilities, but there are they're very small ones, there could be very big ones. Um, but it's kind of like you've gotta have core customers and you gotta move a lot of product through quickly, efficiently. One area that we've made, we've got, was one in Ferrisburg that we've made some significant investments in some of the infrastructure. Um, you know, it's difficult work, first of all. So you've got to, to work in a facility, you've got to be cut from a certain cloth to do that. You've got to have that. And then some of the work physically is really challenging. So they've gotten some new stuff where they, the carcasses are moving, uh, you know, they don't have to really move it or touch it. They've got platforms now that can, you can sit on the platform and work, and you can go up and down, et cetera. But infrastructure is expensive. So you could put a couple hundred thousand dollars into a, um, a meat facility, and it just does a fraction of what it needs to be done. But if we don't have enough places to process, that impacts the land, because then people get discouraged and they're not gonna have animals on the land. So you gotta, you gotta keep it going. But infrastructure is, is the key part with the meat industry to keep it. It's got, gotta be packaged right. Uh, the portable one, uh, that was a poultry one. And I think someone purchased that um, somewhere along the way when I wasn't around. And I don't know if it's, I don't think it's around anymore. It may be, it may be, um, Someone will be using it, per, like bringing the chickens to it now, as opposed to it moving around. There is one, there is one in the works for uh, small ruminants. Small ruminants, sheep, um, and pigs are particularly uh, challenging. Um, most of the slaughter facilities do, you know, beef, um, but um, the small ruminants. But there is a gentleman who's, I think, going to be ready this year to travel around. Uh, with a portable one, which can deal with some of those issues of the smaller producers, uh, and then they wouldn't have to 
wait in line at some of the other facilities because they got the core customers and then if you raise a few animals um, and they all come at the same time because that's the other issue. So they all come in the fall, right? You want to you process in the fall so they get all backlogged there and then there's slower months um, other times of the year. Yes? What about the small on-farm slaughter when somebody comes and slaughters three pigs or something? That Meat regulations are really complicated and it depends. It, it depends if you're, and I'm not even going to touch it because I'll get it wrong. You could, we could spend a whole day going over meat regulations, but we're trying to get some changes made at the federal level to make it a little more flexible to ease up on the on-farm slaughter. Some of it has to do about when you buy it, you have to be present when the slaughter happens, etc. So we're trying to make some Vermont-style friendly changes and still make sure that our meat is safe because we don't want to get in a situation where we have some sanitation issues and we get some meat that is safe. But that's all happening at the federal level. Federal level, federal level is some legislation. We've been working with rural Vermont on some stuff and they've gone down and we're trying to get a little more flexibility that would allow a little more on-farm slaughter um, which would comply with some of the USDA regulations and being able to sell more off the farm, et cetera. But again, um, it's complicated and it takes a huge lift sometimes to get changes made, especially at the federal level. Yes? Yeah, and we do have, um, there is an energy out there of a lot of um, new farmers uh, that really want to, um, to take on an operation. In a vegetable farmer, you don't need a tremendous amount of land. Um, we're a little concerned with the vegetable berry world because of two things that happened last year. One was the hard frost. Do you remember the hard frost in May? Yeah. And that, was, that, that hit a lot of them depending where you were standing, whether it was the grapes that were going to go into the wine, um, or it could have been the apple orchards. Some people manage their orchards a little bit differently. That was a big deal. And then, of course, the flood um, hit the vegetable people probably in the worst way possible because all their expenses were lined up for that big July harvest starting to go to their markets, and a lot of them were wiped out. So that was... That's, it's been a little discouraging uh, with that. So with that, uh, that's a good transition because I got some data on that. How are we doing on time? Are you all right? Yeah, we still got 15 minutes of... Okay, I, I don't want... Do we have a coffee hour? Do we have... What do we, what do, we do? We, we, I don't want to get... Um, in so, we all know with the flood. We know Montpelier, some region, I think it was about 20 towns that really got it whacked. Uh, but also, not only the flood event, it never stopped raining. Many of you probably have gardens, right? Never stopped. Never stopped. So it was really challenging. We're calling it kind of severe weather. So a few things happened. Um, we did some surveys. We had some grant programs to try to get money um, so farmers could live um, maybe another day. Not going to make them whole because of the, the startling. So we did some data, and I'll show you, I'll show you some of the data. 34% um, of our respondents said their loss of feed, feed crops was the most significant damage to their operation. 28% was the average loss of annual income. 28% was the average loss of annual income reported as the direct result of the se severe weather and flooding. 53% of respondents anticip anticipated a feed shortage or problems with feed quality because of severe weather and flooding. That, was, that one's still with us. So, you know, maybe dairy farmers would get maybe four crops in a good year. They may have only gotten two. And the two they got, the quality was poor. So it's just like us. If we eat poorly, we don't, we don't produce, right? I guess that's, and that's the same with a cow or a sheep or a goat. So if they don't get good feed and nutrition, they don't produce as much milk. And if you don't produce enough milk, you don't get paid a decent check. So that was part of it. 56% of respondents said their cash flow will go negative in the next year because of severe weather and flooding. And then the other one issue we found out is 70% have no crop or livestock insurance. Those who do have crop insurance do not receive sufficient premium payouts to cover losses. You say 76% have no crop or 
70% have no crop or livestock insurance. The crop and the insurance programs run through USDA. Uh, essentially, the feedback we've gotten are not to the scale of our farmers. They're, they're maybe for bigger row crops that may be more, you know, bigger states, big row crops. So they're not, and then the return on investment is not that great. So that was the issue. Um, so we did our survey, and then we had a granting program that was run through the Agency of Commerce, which agriculture was eligible for. That was the $20 million one. Um, and I think we kicked out about 3.7 million to a, about 133 farmers. But the losses uh, totaled, because of severe weather and flooding, 69 million. So we figured the loss is about 69 million because of the, the, the weather. So, does the flood, if a flood um, inundates a field, does that mean that field can no longer be organic for a certain number of years? N no, I don't believe so. I believe, I know there was, I know NOFA did do some follow-up on inspections, and that's the other issue that's still with us, and you, you drive around, you see the debris. So there's tremendous amount of de debris in fields. If you drive from Cabot to Montpelier, uh, you see it. Some of those are in farm fields. So that's all got to be cleaned up. USDA has a program that's helping pay for some of the costs. Um, and if you're, you know, during the flooding event, so your crop of, uh, say, carrots was, underwater, that has to be disposed, you can't sell it. So a lot of those farmers, you know, was, was it July 15th, around the middle of July? So a lot of those crops were just starting, particularly the, the greens and whatever were underwater. Blueberries were coming in, so we had blueberry pick your own operations all underwater. Uh, so their entire uh, season was, was lost. So significant uh, losses. Um, so, we did, if you have time, you know, and I can send along, do you have a, like a last email you can send everyone if I send some information? I can, yeah. if everyone wants to do some more work on us. But we did do a, a task force that looked at some of these issues and had some recommendations. Um, and one of those is I think we gotta, we gotta figure out the insurance program that fits the needs of Vermonters. Yes? Um, as far as people losing everything, um, there were a few that, that lost, you know, maybe not everything. And there were some that didn't have any property, like equipment damage. We had some issues with, say, um, the tractor shed was underwater. So they lost their tractors, they lost their tools. Uh, but it was mostly crops. According to this, it says 28.2 was the average loss of annual income reported as direct result of the severe weather and flooding. I don't know if that's gross or net. That's a good question. That's what it says. 28.2% was the average loss of annual income reported as direct, direct result of severe weather and flooding. Yes? I have a bunch of soil questions. Sure. Related to the flooding Hopefully not related to chickens. <laughs> and soil. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's possible conflict within your mission. That yeah, because there is a, um, so we want the soil to be essentially a sponge. So we want, you know, you want healthy soil. You don't, the trend is not to touch it as much as we used to touch it. Like we used to plow every spring, maybe in the fall too. So the, the plan now is sort of the trend has been, and Vermont has 
they just had a, a no-till conference um, uh, with farmers um, a couple weeks ago in Burlington. Um, but you're correct. So there is, so if you're, you're doing, you know, no-till, you're planting cover crops, those cover crops are going to grow, and then you've got the crop that you want to eventually harvest, so maybe it's corn, there are, that does happen where they have to get the weeds down. And so you, there is, and I don't know what the answer to that is, um, because they are, at times, can be in conflict. You're right. But we do have programs um, at the agency that encourage um, no-till, um, manure injection, et cetera, uh, some cost share programs, both at the federal and state level, to encourage uh, more work in soil health, et cetera. I have a similar uh, question about neonates. Yes. Um, I know that there's a big fight going on about them right now. Is there any worry that if people aren't using the neonate coated seeds that they'll use more pesticides and herbicides after the fact? This is a question about, there's a bill in the legislature just passed the Vermont uh, House Ag Committee. It deals with treated seeds. They call them neonics. So they're treated with um, something that um, um, is expected to help the yields and control pests. Um, the advocates of the banning of these neonics um, believe it's detrimental to the bee population and doesn't really um, help the farmer. So there's a uh, proposal to ramp up um, and ban the sale of those um, in Vermont. And it would be, I think, 2029. New York already has legislation similar to this. Um, the question remains, um, what is the replacement seed and where are they going to get it? So that's the other thing that needs to be determined in this kind of interim solution. There's been some work done at Cornell. There's been some work done at, in Quebec. Um, UVM would like to do more research on this. They've started some with extension service. There was a board created by the legislature called the Ag Innovation Board and they studied this issue for basically all last summer, multiple meetings with various folks. And their recommendation was they weren't ready to call for a full ban yet. They said they needed more, more time, more research before um, going to the outright ban. So that was their recommendation. Um, so we'll see how it lands. It goes to the House floor probably when they get back. They're on break this week. I, I'm, my assumption is it will pass, and then it will be the Senate's turn to decide um, what to do. And your question is, yes, there, is, there, are, there are some that believe if, say, there's an outbreak of some particular pest, that then they will treat it with something else. So there is the, that, that could happen. Um, so we'll see how it lands, but it's... Uh, um, um, one of those kind of thorny issues that you know we're trying to trying to navigate. So you know we we love our bees because they are so important to agriculture. We know that they they've been side by side for years, and they you know the, the apple people rely on them. So it, they're important. But then we got some people that are growing corn are getting nervous that, and it's not only cow corn; it's also in your sweet corn too. So you have treated seeds in in other things outside of just feed for animals. Uh, I wondered if you could speak any about the relationship between uh, UVM's research, the extension service, and all of that, and the, the State Department of Agriculture. Is there uh, just broader kind of an idea about how they relate to each other? They, the UVM extension, and the question is about UVM extension and our relationship with them. They are important, important partners for us because the key part is we're regulators, so um, when they see when a farm sees us coming, sometimes they you know they're a little they treat us differently. But when UVM comes, they're not regulating, so they're there to offer technical assistance, they're to offer you know guidance, uh, and they can do some things that clearly we're not we can't do. So um, from time to time, we support um, maybe support a program they're doing, um, whether it be grazing whether it be no-till, et cetera. Um, so UVM Extension is um, a really important partner right down into, you know, 4-H. Um, 4-H is a, you know, a youth program and it's changed over the years, but that's another program that's 
uh, really valuable. But without UVM, um, uh, we'd be probably in a little bit of trouble, of, particularly on the technical assistance. And we can never have enough technical assistance um, and sort of that knowledge that people, when they got a problem, like during the flood, we talked about soil, Extension Service was able to go out and test the soil to make sure it was safe again. So they did do some testing on that. Um, they had their wonderful drone service that was run by UVM, the spatial group. Um, they got those drones up and that got, that got the federal response quicker because they didn't rely on having people go out and take pictures and then send them in. They had all this drone video that they immediately got into FEMA, which probably I think was a couple weeks quicker than we normally go. Yeah, FEMA's a, a, at times can be pretty, pretty complicated. All right, um, yes? You have time to touch on diversification. Yes, diversification. Um, um, that is ongoing. Um, one thing they were seeing is agritourism. Um, you know, if you travel the world now, you like real life experiences, you know? You wanna go places, you wanna learn things, you wanna see things. So there is a trend that is allowing more on-farm stays. You know, the whole issue with where people stay now. We have farms that have actually put on another house and then they're, open, you know, they're renting that out. They get to see the cows, they get to feed the cows. So we're seeing that. We're working on some legislation uh, in Montpelier that would, it's called on-farm accessory businesses. And we talked about how margins are pretty tight with farming. We're hoping to allow um, more diversification on some of these businesses without having to go through the Act 250 process. As you well know, if you touch Act 250, it get, people get really nervous. But say, you know, say you're the beet farmer here and you're the beef farmer over here, um, under the regulations, you've got to make sure 50% of your product under the on-farm accessory business are your products, and if you start putting more somewhere else, then you're in violation and you have to go through Act 250. We think it would be make more sense that you should be able to sell, you're supporting your farmer down here, and we're not gonna turn these into, the fear is they're gonna turn them into a, like a Cumberland Farms. You know, it's gonna become a retail store. That's not the goal. The goal is to support more diversification more leeway for folks because the margins are so tight in agriculture, there's no way they, they can go through the, the regulatory process. So we would like to get some clarity on that. It, we've made some progress with the bill. We don't know where it's gonna end up. But the trend is, yes, lots of diversification. People are growing grains in Vermont now. Um, you have, um, we have saffron farmers. We have more pick your own operations, more, um, selling directly to consumers, and we have a tremendous amount of product that's going in the mail now. The pandemic really changed the game in a lot of places for survival. Cheese in the mail. Um, what's the place in the uh, Matter River Valley that it's uh, traps, they're putting it. We've got um, tulip farms now. You can get a CSA, you know, you can get a, a bouquet of tulips every Saturday from a farm in, in, the, in the Matter River Valley. Is there rice in Vermont? There is rice. We have a rice farmer in Virgins. And I've had that rice and it's amazing the difference between the rice that he grows. It's incredibly good. But he uses his ducks to manage the pests. So it's that, and he's gone to um, Japan to get the infrastructure he needs to harvest and et cetera. But, and we're seeing a lot of I think grains may be um, some of the next thing you're seeing farmers grow more of their own grain as opposed to maybe buying it from the Midwest. Um, hydroponic, yep. The, um, that's a Waitsfield, right? Correct. Yeah, and they do, uh, whether it's tomatoes or basil, right? Yeah, basil. That basil, just incredible amounts of um, basil. And that what, what? Cannabis. Cannabis. Um, we don't have um, a space in cannabis. Um, we maybe, our lab in, 
in Randolph may eventually test some of it. But they have something called the Cannabis Control Board, and they kind of manage the entire operation, whether it's the, whether it's the farmer that's got um, X number of plants um, or a bigger operation. One of my best tours I went on, I went on, not last summer, the summer before, um, I went on a cannabis tour just, because it's, you know, it's a plant. It's just like farming, you're growing a plant, you got pests, you got weeds, you got, you got a light, you got all, soil, all this stuff. So I went on a tour, it was a classic Vermont tour, cannabis, and um, show up at Parker Pie. If anyone been to Parker Pie, what a wonderful pizza. So you show up at Parker Pie, you're supposed to show up at Parker Pie, and then the school bus will pick you up and take you to an undisclosed location. <laughs> so I thought it was very Vermonty. I was like, the, the school bus picks me up, and um, we all get on the school bus, and I don't think, no, I didn't, it was like, it was, you know, it's a beautiful summer day on a Sunday. Yeah, well, it was, I don't know what, I think I, it, it went on for a while, and the bus driver was wonderful because on Monday she was taking the kindergartners, <laughs> big straw, I was just like, only in Vermont, on Sunday the bus is being used for cannabis, but on Monday it's being used for the kindergartners. It was like, it was, yeah, yeah, but it was wonderful. It was like I learned so much in that little, little tour. And in, in the end, it was they got the same issues as someone that's growing kale. You know, they're worried about pests, soil health, et cetera, whether it's going to be a market, where there's too much in the market, the price is going to be down. So they aren't included in your. In your no, they're not. They're not. In, they're not included. And the other thing about cannabis, federally, it's still illegal. So that's, so anything that's remotely, uh, if you accept federal funds, you've got to be very careful about crossing that line because the federal government still does not consider it um, legal. So, trivia time. Now look, it's maple season. All right, so here we go. Trivia time to the first person who gets this right, gets this little bottle of goodness from Ledge Haven Farm in Orwell. All right, what is the state bird? Hermit thrush. I'm gonna go with right down here. And one of the fun bills of this year that we're doing in the legislature is H664. You know what H664 is? Yes. yes. We don't have a state mushroom. <laughs> I didn't want to keep you in the dark. <laughs> uh. So um, some kids down in Wyndham County have gotten together and they found a lawmaker who's also, it look, foraging is huge now. People foraging, it's kind of fun, huh? Yeah, a lot of foragers out there now. So um, the proposal is to create the bear's head tooth as our state mushroom. I guess there's six states that already have a state mushroom, but we would be the seventh. So they testified, and I think they'll be back. So if you want to have fun, we all got to have a little bit of fun at the state house, right? Can't all be taxes and schools and agriculture stuff. And I'm just gonna end on a, you know, we talked about the um, um, farmers have been struggling. There is some private people that are out raising money. It's called uh, Dig Deep for Local Vermont Farms. And I'm gonna leave some of these cards here. This is where if you've got a farmer in your county you wanna donate, um, you can donate 10 bucks, 50 bucks. If you really wanna donate, go wild and then they're gonna distribute uh, micro grants to the farmers they are still trying to dig out from this. But it has support of some important partners like the ski areas. Ski areas understand if we don't have farms, it hurts their industry, you know. Uh, they're dependent on the weather, so the ski areas are behind it, some of the credit unions are behind it, some of the former executives of Cabot behind it, Vermont Association of Broadcasters. Um, so, it's, and it's a, go right to your phone, I'm just gonna leave them here and yeah, we can leave them on the table. all right that's good um, well this has been too much fun <laughs> I don't normally have so much fun
That's good. So, anyway, well, thank you for the. I didn't bring cheese. That's the thing about being the, I eat like so much. It's, it's one of the best, and I know where the best food is, <laughs> best drink is. I know the emerging companies that are coming along the line. They got, there's a goat gelato. Has anyone had the goat gelato from uh, down in Virgin's? It's not goaty. It's really incredible. So there's stuff like that. So all this goat, goat gelato, uh, Lulu ice cream is an emerging company. Um, and um, she's developing new products. She's supporting, she's buying some goat's milk from a local farmer, so it's helping that farmer, what we want to do. And before you know it, she could be the next Ben and Jerry's. But small batch ice cream is, is something people are really craving now. And we've got some new cheese people coming online. So thank you for supporting agriculture, yes? I don't have um, I don't have any jurisdiction of it. We occasionally um, help because they are using some Vermont products. For example, a Lawson's, a Sip of Sunshine. They have a maple, and I learned I, I toured the facility a few weeks ago, and I learned eight percent of that. I think it's a sixteen ouncer. Eight percent of it is Vermont maple in it. So they use a lot of Vermont maple in that particular in that product. So there's there's things like that. We're trying to get. More grains grown, so you know we have a significant hops farm in uh, Vermont, which is kind of neat. They're in Moncton, I believe. And if you ever get a chance to see that place in the fall, I mean the yeah, trellises to the, you know, to the heavens, but it's absolutely gorgeous. So they're trying to, you know, a lot of our hops um, is coming for either from Europe or Michigan's a big state way out west. So they're trying to make inroads to the local breweries, which we have a, you know, a significant amount. So they're starting to use it, but again, it's consistency. So they're developing it, consistent product. And then they have a, uh, I think a market where some of the home brewer people, uh, they can sell if you need hops for that. So. You know how many breweries? Pardon? What about bees into, bee honey into gin? Oh yes. Well, I don't know the one right, the one right in town is another story, and the founder of that is about to start a new company with another distillery in Addison County. So the original Caledonia Spirits gentleman, he's working on another one. So there's, but his goal is to, and he's always ten or fifteen years ahead of everybody. He's, his goal is to grow more local grains to support more land that could be left in ag production, and then. Um, so um, originally, I think Greensboro slash Hardwick, yes. Bar Hill, which was named, you know, you know, quality, incredible product. But again, so all these businesses are just, it takes so much, I wish everyone understood how difficult it is to get a product to, to, to the public and then consistently deliver it. Um, you know, distribution is a nightmare, really hard. Um, Not really. We do have uh, we do have a, a distribution um, out of Hardwick that makes deliveries in the Boston market. Uh, Brooklyn, New York, is a big market for a lot of our a lot of our food, so we have trucks that go there. Um, but the amount of commerce that's being done uh, in the mail is extraordinary. So we've got to work on infrastructure, we've got to work on places where people can aggregate, you know, farmer can bring it off the hill, bring it to a place, truck can pick it up and get it on the road because we don't want 30 trucks going on the same road. Yeah, they, they are, but they're such at a scale. You know, we need the smaller scale, so. All right. Well, thank you.